Namaste. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. One correction. I, I did not graduate in 1944. I, I would love to, because then I would have, you know, a, a magic potion for keeping looking relatively young. As for graduation 1944, who knows what happens. It's my great pleasure to be here. And there is one other thing to correct. If you look in the program and if you look what is written here, you may think that Poland is yet another state in the Republic of India, because I'm, a, I'm among Indian speakers. Unfortunately not, but I'm privileged to be in this session. I was asked to discuss a philosophical question, where to start uh, any intervention about diabetes remission, whether at the level of obesity or prediabetes. So I will try to ponder for a few minutes about this choice, although it is an artificial discussion, we know it. Obesity and prediabetes very frequently go together, and anything we will do, as we beautifully heard in a previous lecture, will help. The best thing would be to stop eating at all, but that's pretty likely. Uh, just to, a few slides from the place I'm coming from, you know, the states of India, the speakers are coming from, I'm coming from Warsaw. This is capital now of our country, but it was totally destroyed during Second World War. It was just a pile of rubble. So it's not, it looks old, but it's basically pretty new. And this is the hospital where I'm working. In the second building, high building on the third floor, there is a diabetes and internal medicine department. Okay, if we talk about diabetes prevention, the, ma the major paper, the major study which has been published, published over 20 years ago, a diabetes prevention program, we know it very well, uh, and we know it was shown that if we use metformin, people may uh, develop diabetes slowly, if they, uh, lose li if they use lifestyle, it's even more effective, uh, twice as much. Uh, but the people who were enrolled in this study were people with prediabetes. These were people with IGT, uh, and uh, all the perspective, the way the study was assessed, was clearly glucose-centric. So people are on the way to diabetes, they already have glucose intolerance, what we can do to lower the risk of developing diabetes. And if we look at the uh, stages, how much having prediabetes is a risk factor for diabetes. Obviously, if you have impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance, the risk is much higher than you just have over twice as high than you have just almost all, only impaired fasting glucose. So for when we talk about diabetes prevention, we think about pre-diabetes, the term coined by the Americans just to attract attention of the media. Uh, and this is not an ideal term, by the way, because if anyone has pre-diabetes, the suggestion is that late, sooner or later the person will develop diabetes because already he or she has pre-diabetes. And that we know, of course, is not true. We may reverse go back from pre-diabetes to normal glucose tolerance. We did some studies where I uh, work as well. Uh, this table shows study, one of my students who did the PhD project took two group of patients at the primary care level, and what she did, she saw them every month for three months, or saw them only twice, once and after three months. And this more intervention group is on the left, group one, and if you look at BMI, you're seeing a patient for every, uh, every month reduce their body weight, and of course reduce their fasting glucose, 115 to 104. Some of them returned to normal glucose tolerance. We again looked at this study through impaired fasting glucose. This was the enrollment criteria. Uh, but the major effect, if we look at this table again, is on body weight. And this is where we should really concentrate on. This would be the, the conclusion of my short talk. Obesity is the strongest risk factor for diabetes, plus age, plus family history. There are the three most stronger ones. But intervention within obesity brings greater results. This, is, this study was cited today already, a nurse's health study. Very clear, linear, increased risk of diabetes, also within the normal level of BMI. If you look at BMI between 20 to 25, someone who's 22 has about half of the risk of developing diabetes than someone who has BMI of 25. So that's a linear relationship. 
And we are unlucky uh, living in Asia because the threshold for overweight obesity is lower than in Western Europe. As much as I love coming here, I'm always unhappy because I'm already more obese when I am in India. So the task which is in front of you is greater than we have in uh, Europe, for instance. But this is a very simple study and interesting observation. People were put on a diet and they were made to lose weight. And if you look at the upper curve, this is how they lose weight within just six weeks. And the lower curve is how their glucose improved. And glucose improved dramatically, I'd say, at the very beginning of the weight loss. Then it did not improve that much. This is, in a way, the key to understanding how can we prevent diabetes. The moment people will lose uh, the abundance of fat in their body, this uh, that greatly improves insulin sensitivity and, of course, lowers blood glucose. Uh, so this reduction, the effect of any intervention in body weight is not exactly parallel in terms of effect on body weight and glucose control. And if we, again, go back to a diabetes prevention program, uh, which I started my presentation with, the effect of uh, remission uh, of, of prevention of diabetes was largely carried by the weight loss. If you look here, people with lifestyle had the greatest prevention, uh, the greatest reduction in diabetes, diabetes risk, and they also had the greatest weight loss. So this is the gate to what we would like to achieve. And that sounds pretty obvious, but I will show you in more details how we can how we should really look at it. The final confirmation that body weight is the key to prevent diabetes comes from bariatric surgery, one of many studies. This was done in China, and patients who underwent surgery, bariatric surgery, had normalized BMI and had basically normalized blood glucose. And of course, it's because of BMI was normalized glucose the other way. But the issue is a little bit more complex. If we approach a person, a, pay, a, pay, a person who is obese, uh, we expect them to have uh, diabetes, hypertension, bone pains, knee joint pains, depression, all sorts of problems. And it's all true, but for diabetes. If we look at this picture, I took this picture in Italy and one camping site. Uh, these people are enjoying the lunch. And if I ask you who, uh, who out of them has diabetes, simplest answer would be, well, everyone. They are all pretty much obese, and why shouldn't they have diabetes? The fact is, when I talk to these people, that only this gentleman had diabetes, the one on the right. But if you look on the one on the left, his risk factor, which is belly, seems to be a bit bigger than the one in a blue T-shirt. So it's not that simple, not that it's linear, again, that once you are obese, your diabetes is for sure, you're 100% sure it will develop. So let's look at the history, natural history of type 2 diabetes, because if we want to prevent it, we want to act at the very beginning of all the derangements. And we know this story for many, many years. It's been described even in 1980s, uh, that the first is the rise in insulin resistance, and then combined with beta cell dysfunction, eventually type 2 diabetes develops. So if you look at these two people from previous picture, the one who does not have diabetes is here, and he's more obese than the one who already has diabetes, who's somewhere here. He already has the decrease in insulin secretion. So if we talk about prevention, we should, of course, concentrate on people, and, it, and we also heard it in the last, in the previous lecture, in people with a as little changes in insulin secretion as possible. So it's rather obesity than prediabetes. In a way, prediabetes is a bit too late. We still can do a lot, but it is a bit too late. And then I would like you to explain in even more detail showing you this uh, figure. It's not a very new study, <coughs> but I think it beautifully shows uh, where all the relationship between obesity and glucose uh, level are. Uh, from diabetes prevention perspective. This is the figure which shows the relationship between insulin sensitivity, which is on the X axis. Uh, so the more on the right, the more sensitive a person is. One dot here is one person. And the Y axis shows beta cell function. 
These three groups of people are grouped along three curves. These are those who are healthy, have normal glucose tolerance. These are the people with IgT, and these are the people with diabetes. And let's look at this person here. This is a healthy person, very highly insulin sensitive. This person requires relatively low level of insulin to control their blood glucose. And look at the person at the other end of this curve, still a healthy individual, normal glucose level, uh, but much less insulin, much more insulin resistant. And this person requires the pancreas to release four or five times more insulin to control blood glucose. Okay, that, that's, I guess that's obvious, you know how it develops. We can see these people, but I bet the one on the left at the top is much more obese or simply weighs more than the one on the right. And then look at the person with diabetes here. People with diabetes are all more or less insulin resistant, low insulin sensitivity. They do produce insulin, but not enough. This is what we call beta cell dysfunction. But if you look at the insulin level between this person with diabetes and this healthy person, this is exactly the same. So what makes people develop diabetes, if you look here, the main difference between them is just insulin resistance. So those ones who are insulin sensitive, they don't need a lot of insulin. They may have very lousy pancreas. They may have family history of diabetes. But as long as they maintain as low body weight as possible, they will not develop diabetes. On the other hand, you may have the same level of insulin, but being insulin resistant, you will have diabetes because it will not be enough. And let's look at the person with prediabetes here, like this one. This is the person, if we look at the difference between this person and the one who's healthy at the top and the one who has diabetes at the bottom, the change here is only insulin. So there are two lenses we could look at. it. We could look through insulin resistance, which I think is crucial for insulin prevention, for diabetes prevention, and I have one more argument. Any drug shown to reduce uh, the risk of developing diabetes are the drugs which affect insulin resistance. This is metformin. This is pioglitazone, which is not used for this purpose because it's not a very nice, it's an effective drug, but has its uh, side effects. Uh, and none of the drugs which increase insulin release, like meglitonide, sulfonylureas, they have never been shown, uh, even DP4 inhibitors, to reduce the risk of developing diabetes. DLP1 analogs showed as sub studies or sub analysis, but they dramatically reduce body weight, meaning reduce insulin resistance. So having prediabetes. Okay, we can still prevent diabetes, but as I said already, it's just too way too late. So, just to make some final conclusion in this, as I said, philosophical question, uh, quite well understood. If we look at <coughs> this uh, dilemma, whether it's obesity or prediabetes, if we find obesity with all available therapies, we heard about. A lifestyle intervention, crucial, we all know it, we repeat it at every lecture, and we are as lousy as we are, as it is only possible in enforcing it in our patients. Maintaining it is difficult. We are using drugs and GLP-1 receptor analogs, which are our blockbuster agents. Uh, and I, I know you know all about them. I know you try them, you use them. They are, you have to kill someone who has this drug to use it in Europe because it's basically unavailable unless you travel to the US. I only prescribe a dulaglutide or semaglutide if a patient promises me that he will uh, convince the, the owner of the pharmacy to laugh him and will keep one packet secretly just for the person and get it. And these difficulties will maintain for months I, as, as we are told. But our experience already with GLP-1 analogs shows that these are the drugs who are, and that's the way I look at them. They are not, they are of course weight loss agents, but the main reason why I prescribe as much as it is possible to have GLP-1 analogs is that these drugs help our patients change their lifestyle. These are the drugs which the patients tell us, look, I first time forever, I feel full, I've never 
school, I may eat less, I may exercise more. So uh, I guess we don't look all at these drugs like this way, but these are the drugs which eventually give us the tool to achieve not just using a drug, but this lifestyle change. Uh, crucial, vital, without it, nothing will happen uh, in metabolic medicine. So we can use all therapies here, non-pharmacological, pharmacological, bariatric, and we will achieve at least three things then if we effectively fight obesity at some level. We will have weight loss, we will have lower insulin resistance, and of course, we will have lower blood glucose. If, on the other hand, look, we look only at prediabetes, and because of the name of prediabetes, diabetes being mentioned already, we concentrate on glucose treatment, glucose level, and that means basically pharmacotherapy, of course, lifestyle, but pharmacotherapy as well. Metformin is registered to be in prediabetes. Uh, then we are achieving only lower blood glucose. Metformin is not the drug which will uh, largely change patients' body weight. So the choice seems obvious. Uh, addressing obesity will bring much greater results. And at the same time, of course, will decrease the risk of prediabetes because obesity leads to pre and diabetes and then diabetes. But in fact, and I guess that could be the summary of all this session uh, with wonderful previous uh, lectures, uh, we just should do anything. Just try to uh, change one thing, two things in the lives of our patients, lower their body weight of by one, two, five kilograms. It will bring effect, effect already, as I showed you, uh, because it is the race against time. I showed you this figure, old figure with the type 2 diabetes natural history. If we do any intervention early, that would be great. If we wait, if time goes on, and the patient will have diabetes, as we heard previously, over six years, five, six years, have lower insulin secretion, uh, be already on some medication, then the chance of having any effective long-term remission is very low. And how we can achieve it? Then I'm a bit of auto-ironic because we talk to our patients about the things we also love to do. That's a picture of myself having some nice steak. I guess it was somewhere in the US. So we shouldn't be doing this, and we, of course, shouldn't be doing that. And that's also unfortunate for me. I'm not saying we should be giving good examples. That just should be after ourselves. Uh, but I'm just showing you how common are the challenges we are facing together with all our Thank you very much for your attention. Then you are.